Uh, welcome to our webinar uh, from A to Zip, what you need to know about the IBM Specialty Processor. My name is Craig Mullins, and I'll be your speaker today. Before we begin the webinar, I want to quickly mention that CloudFrame has published an ebook that I wrote on Zips uh, under the same title as this webinar, From A to Zip. It goes into a little more uh, depth on some of the topics that we'll be discussing here today. So be sure to visit the link and that's shown on the slide here and request your own copy of the ebook. So um, here we see the agenda that I'll be covering today in about 45 minutes or so. We'll uh, start off defining what a specialty processor is and spend a little bit of time defining what the zip is. Uh, then we'll explain how using zips can lower your IBM Z software costs. Uh, next, I'll discuss some of the nuances of the zip, such as uh, what it means to be zip eligible. Um, I'll discuss wh why eligibility doesn't guarantee that your workload's gonna actually run on the zip. Uh, and then we'll look at what types of workloads can run on the zip uh, because not everything can. Uh, then we'll discuss the benefits of running your Java workloads on the zip because this can possibly create uh, significant cost savings. Um, then we'll look at several common mistakes and obstacles you might experience along the way and some best practices uh, for your COBO applications. And, and then we'll kind of finish up with some suggested next steps you can take to hopefully help you improve your cost savings with Zip. And that's a lot to cover in 45 minutes. So let's get on with it. And we'll start at the beginning, uh, rightly enough, and uh, answer the question, what is a specialty processor? Well, the basic idea of a specialty processor is that it's going to augment the general purpose mainframe CPU. So instead of running all your workloads on the general process, I'm sorry, the general purpose processor, specific workloads can be moved to the specialty processors to run. And you want to do that for a variety of reasons. And we'll look into those. Uh, anyway, IBM has introduced several different types of specialty processors. You've got the ICF, or Integrated Coupling Facility, and the IFL, or the Integrated Facility for Linux. And they're designed for certain types of workloads with uh, you know, coupling facility workload in the case of the ICF and, and processing your Linux workload in the case of the IFL. So if you run these types of workloads on those specialty processors, then the processing cycles aren't gonna to apply to your monthly IBM software charges. And this cost benefit is you know, really quite straightforward for these two types of specialty processors. Next, we get the zip and, and it's a similar benefit but there are a lot of nuances that need to be understood and considered. And, and this is really going to be the focus of uh, today's presentation. Before moving along, though, I, I want to mention that there used to be a fourth type of mainframe specialty processor called the ZAP, or the Application Assist Processor. And its usage was designed specifically for Java workloads and XML parsing, your application related things. However, Late in 2009, IBM provided the ability for ZAP workload to run on the ZIP. So you can run both ZIP and ZAP eligible workloads on that single type of specialty processor, the ZIP. So basically, the ZAP is obsolete and it's no longer sold or used. All right, so let's dig into a bit more about the ZIP. It's the integrated information processor. Um, when you activate zip processors, some percentage of the relevant workload gets redirected off the general processors and onto the zip specialty processor. So it's no longer running on your main CP, it's running on the zip. Generally speaking, you can implement up to two zips per general purpose CP. And it's important to keep in mind that zips are never kneecapped. They run at the full capacity of the chip. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, well, 
some general purpose CPs get kneecapped by IBM. And that basically means that they're designed not to run at full capacity. Uh, whether or not your general purpose CP is kneecapped depends on the mainframe model you're running, you know, what you've bought from IBM, but the zip is never kneecapped. So the zip may have more capacity in it than your general purpose CP because that kneecapping doesn't happen with the zip. Anyway, um, the primary purpose of uh, redirecting your work to the zip is that IBM is not gonna impose any software charges on workloads that run on the zip. Okay, so let's back up a minute. You may have noted that I said relevant workload. So, you know, the question you probably have is what's relevant? Not everything can run on the zip. Only workloads that IBM sanctions are permitted. And these are typically new workloads, things that are uh, modern capabilities. Uh, you know, the original purpose of the zip was to support running that newer DB2 functionality. And that's why it's called the integrated information processor, information data, DB2 database. But, but over time, the list of what is eligible to run on the zip has greatly expanded from that DB2 workload. And when you look um, you know, at a high level at some of the supported workloads, you see things like you know, Java, um, ZOS container extensions, uh, Watson machine learning for ZOS, the Z15 system recovery boost. And yeah, it's just things like certain types of DB2 processing. Additionally, other ISVs than IBM have ZIP enabled their products. And that allows portions of those workloads to run on the ZIP processor. Uh, and you know that's, that's good. You know, the more workload we can get running on the ZIP as opposed to the, the main processor, the lower our uh, processing monthly peaks are. And we'll get into why that's important uh, in a minute. And we'll also take a look at you know, the relevant workloads in a bit more detail coming up. Now, there are limits to your usage of ZIPs that you have to understand. Um, originally, you could have no more than one ZIP per general purpose processor. Uh, but today, uh, most models allow two ZIPs per uh, GP. Um, secondly, IBM's license agree licensing agreement for ZIPs puts strict restrictions on the kind of code that is eligible to run on a ZIP. The code has to run in a ZOS enclave under the control of an SRB or service request block. Uh, We'll look more at SRBs and enclaves it, it also in a moment. So you know, we're still here you know, at, at the high levels. Additionally, you have to keep in mind that not all ZIP eligible workloads will actually run on the ZIP. It can be troublesome to kind of understand exactly what's being redirected, exactly when it is, and how much of that workload is really being redirected to your ZIPs. But the primary intent of the ZIP is to reduce your IBM software costs. And the more workload that can be redirected to the zip, the more your monthly cost savings can be from an IBM software perspective. Okay, so, so the primary question you probably have right now is, you know, how can the zip lower my mainframe costs? After all, you know, cost reduction is almost always at the top of the list of most IT department's objectives, at least management's objectives, right? Well, there's a software and a hardware component to the cost savings that ZIPs offer. The biggest consideration is that workloads that run on a specialty processor are not subject to IBM software license charges. And that, that's true for other ISVs uh, too, depending on what your licensing arrangement is with them. Now, if you've ever researched mainframe software pricing, you know that over time, software costs can probably be many multiples more expensive than the hardware cost. Now that said, mainframe prices, pricing and licensing is a complex topic and it can be pretty confusing. 
But at a high level, your organization's monthly mainframe software bill is usually based on your peak average usage during the month. There's more considerations and it can differ depending on the pricing model your organization use. And, and we'll kind of look at that in more detail in just a minute. Anyway, most mainframe software contracts are tied to the processor size of the machine where that software is gonna be run. And the cost of the software rises as the capacity of the mainframe rises. But if capacity can be redirected to the ZIP, to a specialty processor, then that workload doesn't factor into those licensing charges. So if you redirect enough workload to those processors, the specialty processors like the ZIP, you can achieve significant, meaningful cost savings. Okay, another benefit is hardware. First of all, the ZIPs, especially processors in general, are significantly cheaper to acquire than general purpose mainframe uh, CPs. A standard uh, mainframe CP can cost more than half a million dollars, US dollars. Uh, but the list price of a specialty processor is uh, about a quarter of that. And, and that's list price. Street price uh, might be even less. And keep in mind that specialty processors are purchased for a one-time charge per engine including no charge replacement by faster zip engines when you upgrade to a new machine. So a lot of organizations are using specialty processors as a way to help delay and defer costly upgrades. And then they get their most from the upgrade when they have to do one because you're moving, you automatically get those uh, uh, zips upgraded at no charge when you go to the upgraded processor. Okay. So to really understand what can run on the ZIP, you have to define what we mean by ZIP eligible. And workload ZIP eligible when it runs in an enclave SRB, service request block, I mentioned that earlier. Though this is really most important for software developers, the people who are writing the code to run on the ZIP, um, it, let's talk about this in just a little more detail. You know, for, for mainframe ZOS program, code can execute in one of two modes, TCB mode, that's also known as task mode or SRB mode. Most programs execute under the control of the task. Each thread that's running is represented by a TCB, a task control block. And a program can exploit multiple processors if it's composed of multiple tasks. And many programs really are composed of multiple tasks. Now an SRV, SRB or service request block is a control block that performs a particular function or service in a specific address space. Uh, an SRB is more lightweight and it's more efficient, but it has some limitations, like they can't own storage areas. They can obtain reference used in free storage, but a TCB has to own the storage area. Then there's preemptible enclaves. Uh, running in an SRB, they're used to do the work on behalf of the originating address space. Enclaves help to manage mainframe transactions for a non-traditional workload. You're, you can think of an enclave sort of as an anchor point for accumulating resources. Regardless of where that transaction's executing, it's kind of anchored into that enclave. Now, all of this is kind of a long way of saying that to be ZIP eligible, there's a specific type of coding and processing that's required. It has to run in an enclave SRB. But again, all of those, I went over that fast, but keep in mind, you're probably not gonna be dealing with that. It's your vendors who are dealing with that. Okay, back to ZIP eligibility. It's important that you understand that only certain types of workload are eligible to run on the ZIP. If it's eligible, the workload can be redirected to run on the ZIP instead of the general purpose processor. Now, simply because a workload is ZIP eligible does not mean it will run on the ZIP. 
the workload has to be redirected from the general purpose CP to the zip. And that means the system may try to run the workload on the zip, but that may or may not actually happen for a number of different reasons. Okay, so what type of stuff is zip eligible? Now, there are many types of workloads that are zip eligible, and this slide shows a list of some of them. It's not an exhaustive list. If you're really interested in that exhaustive list, uh, you can go to this link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, IBM maintains that, and it includes both IBM software and any ISV software that IBM is aware of. So if we look at what I've thrown onto the slide here, you see the first thing is probably the DB2 for ZOS stuff. Uh, it was the first target for ZIP eligibility. So it kind of makes sense that there's a list of ZIP eligible DB2 work that you have to keep in mind. Um, at a high level, probably the most important thing uh, that you might want to target is remote SQL that's issued via DRDA and your native REST calls. And, and most modern new applications are built using those type of techniques as, as opposed to your, your standard uh, static SQL techniques. So that makes your modern stuff zip eligible, your modern DB2 stuff. Uh, another potential for redirecting DB2 workload to the zip is parallel uh, query child processes. So you might consider enabling more parallelism in your DB2 workloads and you know, you have to bind your applications in a particular way to get that to happen. Um, you know, XML stuff, some utility processing, uh, lots of good stuff in DB2 that can be zip eligible. Next, and probably uh, the next biggest opportunity is Java workloads. You know, most of the work uh, done by your COBOL application programs are not zip eligible. Only portions of that workload may be eligible depending on what your COBOL programs are doing and whether each specific task they're doing is zip eligible or not. You know, is it XML? Is it a parallel query process in DB2, et cetera? Java workloads are eligible to run on the zip. This is a case whether you're running the Java in batch and kicks, MQ, you know, really you know, wherever they run. The other thing to take away from this slide is to note that the type of workload we see as being zip eligible is a specific type of workload, right? Generally Rick, can I speaking, interrupt for a second? I have a question yeah, sure. that I think Hopefully. is relevant for before we move on. Um, right. Someone in the audience asked, is there a tool to verify if my workloads are eligible for zip? Whether they're eligible for zip, I am not aware of a tool that will tell you that. You'll have to look through the documentation. Whether it ran on the zip or not, most of the ZOS performance monitors, um, you, you things like Omegamon and Tmon and MainView, and even like IntelliMagic and some of their stuff, uh, it's going to tell you uh, what ran on the zip and uh, what didn't. So you can look at it and see what's what has been run there. But to figure out what's eligible, you have to know up front. You have to consult that list, know the type of stuff that you're doing, and move forward. At, at least I'm not aware of anything that shows it. Okay. All right. Thanks for answering that. No problem. Uh, and just uh, for the, the participants in the webinar today, in the chat, uh, of the webinar, I'm going to post a couple of the links that uh, Craig has mentioned. There was one at the bottom of the slide a couple of slides ago. I'll put that into the chat, as well as the URL for downloading the ebook that Craig mentioned when we started. So look for that in the chat. All right, Craig, carry on. Okay. So you know what can run on the zip? Yeah, typically, it's not the batch and transaction workload that's run on your mainframe for years, and you know the stuff that the Z is most known for. Instead, it's your newer types of workloads, your Java, your XML, your distributed workloads, things of that nature. And, and when you think about that, it kind of makes sense, right? You know, let the mainframe continue to handle the workloads that it's been handling efficiently for decades. 
but give customers a way to continue to use the mainframe in a cost-effective way for their new stuff. And if the new stuff doesn't incur a monthly software charge, it's a cost-effective way to implement that new stuff on the mainframe. It, it's a smart marketing move by IBM. It extends the usefulness and lifespan of the mainframe. And one of the biggest benefactors of the ZIP is Java. There are a lot of benefits, you know, I've listed five here, you know, go through them one by one. Of course, the first is cost reduction. Any programs running on the ZIP don't impact your monthly software bill. Uh, that means that running Java instead of other types of work can significantly help to reduce cost. Another benefit is maybe it can be easier to support Java than COBOL. COBOL is aging. Programmers capable of coding and maintaining it properly are aging too. Now, of course, COBOL's age is not the problem. Plenty of older things remain viable and continue to thrive. And, and COBOL is not stayed static or stuck in the 1950s when it was developed. You know, but skilled COBOL developers are not necessarily easy to find. So Java is a newer more thriving language came out in 95. So I wouldn't necessarily call Java shiny and new, but it's more modern than COBOL. It's object oriented. It's taught in most college computer science courses. And it's one of the world's most popular programming languages. You know, Java regularly ranks in the top three languages of the Toyobi index. Uh, and that tracks the popular computer programming languages. Then number three, we've got code maintenance, and that may be easier with Java. You know, if your developers are trained in Java, they're more likely to be able to maintain and manage Java code than for programming languages they don't know. Uh, it's not necessarily that Java is inherently easier to understand, inherently easier to maintain than COBOL. It's just that most new developers these days use object-oriented design and agile methods. And that's used with Java instead of waterfall design and structured programming techniques that you need for COBOL development. Then we get to the question of speed. Everybody knows that Java is slow, right? Well, that's one of the common knowledge items that's kind of been passed around from one programmer to another for so long that few of us even question it anymore. And it may have been true, you know, a decade or so ago, but, but today, sometimes Java can run as fast as or even faster than COBOL. Some of CloudFrame's customers have found that their refactored Java was running faster on the mainframe than the equivalent COBOL that they had converted from. Now, I'm not saying that all Java will outperform COBOL, just like I'm not saying that all COBOL will outperform Java. But it's not a given that converting from COBOL to Java means things get slower. Another speed consideration. If the Java code runs on a zip and your main CP is kneecapped, then the higher speed of the zip, which is never kneecapped, may enable your Java code to run faster than the equivalent COBOL. And finally, portability. You know, Java is a portable language. It can be easily transported from one environment to another. You know, Java gets compiled into bytecodes, and uh, those bytecodes can be run on any machine that has a JVM capable of interpreting them. So, so there are potentially many benefits to modernizing your mainframe workload uh, to allow it to run on Java. However, there are uh, potentially um, some common mistakes and obstacles. Hopefully, uh, I've made the case for the zip, uh, but you know, what kind of things do you have to watch out for? Uh, the first is assuming that everything that's, el that's eligible to run on that zip is actually going to run on it. It may seem like a reasonable assumption, but it doesn't take into account generosity factor. <laughs> Haven't mentioned that yet. When you activate your zip, some percentage of that relevant workload gets redirected to the zip, but not 100% of it. Uh, when the enclave gets created by a product you're using, there's a parameter that can be set for the CPU percentage that ZOS can make eligible to run on the zip. 
And that's what's referred to as the generosity factor. It tells the system how generous it should be when it's redirecting workload to zips. As an example, the DB2 distributed DRDA SQL requests we talked about. If you look at the DB2 doc, it says that up to 60% of the instructions for distributed SQL can run on the zip. So there's your generosity factor, 60%. Um, there's some nuances to how that actually gets implemented, but the net result is that you'll only get a maximum of 60% of this type of workload to run on your zips. So this gets back into, you know, can it tell me what's zip eligible? Really, you have to dig into the documentation to figure out what, not only what is eligible, but what the specific generosity factor is for each type of workload. Is it 60%? Is it 100%? Is it this portion of this program? And that can take some time. Another stumbling block could be lack of planning. Um, probably the most important thing you need to consider is how much workload that you have is zip eligible, and then how many zips you need to deploy to support that workload. Uh, once you know your zip potential, you need to ensure that you have enough capacity to process it. Another consideration is setting the honor priority parameter. Uh, that's a ZOS system setting. Uh, it's set by your system programmers, and there's two options, uh, yes or no. If you set it to yes, uh, it says that standard CPs can execute zip eligible and non-zip eligible work in priority order. If zip processes are unable to execute that zip eligible work, yes is the default. However, if you set it to no, work that is running on the zip won't receive help from your standard processors. That means that zip eligible work because redirected waits. There's some caveats there uh, and all the details get, can be a little, um, difficult to get into and explain in a high level presentation like this. However, the big trade off is performance versus cost. The best practice approach is to ensure you have sufficient capacity for the zip and that you can process your workload on those zips and then set honor priority to yes. You, what you don't want is workload shuttling back and forth. And with yes, that can happen. But you, if you do sufficient capacity planning, then there should be minimal need for that workload to go back and forth. Final obstacle could be lack of understanding. Um, fully appreciate the cost saving potentials of the zip. You really have to understand how software pricing and billing works. And you know we'll take a look at that in a moment. So let's look at some zip best practices. And the first is to understand what type of workload can run on the zip and which of your applications can benefit from running on the zip. Keep that IBM link I shared with you earlier handy. It's at the bottom of the slide here. And as David said, he shared it in the chat. Again, not everything zip eligible can or will run on the zip. And a common mistake is not understanding that it's not possible to specifically say this workload has to run on a zip. Um, there's things behind it, generosity factor, your honor priority setting, uh, and whether or not it's zip eligible. So if we look at that, uh, the decision whether to run on the zip or not is made at execution time uh, by ZOS and the workload manager. Why wouldn't zip eligible work run on the zip? Maybe there's no zip installed. Uh, maybe the, all of them are busy or the generosity factor comes into play. Um, although the workload's eligible, it falls outside the, proceed, the permitted percentage. Uh, all those things uh, can come into play. Uh, sometimes people don't fully understand these nuances before they uh, implement ZIP. It also makes sure sense to train your developers to understand what type of processing is ZIP eligible. Do that research what's eligible, and then focus on implementing those types of things. Consult that DB2 specific list, implement those uh, things and favor you know, your parallel queries, favor your distributed stuff, you favor uh, loads instead of running equivalent COBOL programs. 
And, and finally, understand your licensing. Uh, what licensing model does your organization use? And, and, and where are your monthly peaks? Of course, IBM pricing models are complex and a full discussion of the topic requires more space than I have available right now. But you know, the first thing to understand really is which one of these pricing models uh, is in place at, at your organization. Is it full capacity? Is it sub capacity? And uh, achieving costs with sub capacity pricing, you really need to know where your monthly usage peaks occur. So you see things like sub capacity, AWLC, ZNALC, you know, these are examples, and I'm not going to get into what all those really mean, but I, I do want to spend a little bit of time discussing things like CPU utilization and the rolling four-hour average and how that impacts your monthly software bill. Now, most organizations use some kind of subcapacity pricing, and the general idea is that you pay based on your MLC software's peak monthly rolling four-hour average usage by LPAR. MLC stands for monthly license charge, and it includes most things like uh, your system software, your ZOS, your DB2, your Kicks, your IMS, uh, your compilers, and some system management tools. Uh, IBM documents the full list of what's MLC, and when you uh, buy those products, you uh, agree to pay for them monthly, uh, either based on usage or based on full capacity. Okay, so take a look at the graph here. We see uh, IMSU or instantaneous MSU consumption. Uh, these are the light blue uh, vertical bars, you know, going up and down here. And we see over time as we go across the continuum, the IMSU is spiky. The rolling four hour average, which is documented, is an average of the past four hours of instantaneous MSU consumption. And it's calculated automatically by uh, the operating system every five minutes. Each hour, it takes the 12 five minute values and comes up with a rolling four hour average. So every five minutes, a new IMSU reading is taken, it's added to the average, the oldest one rolls off. So you have this continuously updated rolling four hour average, which isn't spiky, but it does go up and down in a uh, rolling mode. Each month, your organization submits a report of this usage. You use the SCRT report and you give that to IBM. IBM reads the report, generates a bill for you based on your peak rolling four hour average usage. Okay, why did I go into all that? With subcapacity pricing, redirecting workloads to zips may or may not impact your monthly IBM software bill, depending on whether the workload is shifted during the peak. Now, there are going to be multiple peaks based on LPARs and products running in LPARs. I'm not going to get into all that. But I do want you to understand what I mean by this peak, because it means sometimes zips will save you money, sometimes they won't. Look at the graph here. And this represents, say it represents the monthly peak for your shop for you know, last month. If we shift workload that runs at about 6 a.m. here, we see this, um, and we shift that to the zip, this really wouldn't impact our monthly software bill because you know, if we look at this, the goal should be to shift workload at the rolling four hour peak the peak of the green bar, the green line. This comes around 1800 hours. So if we save work by shifting to the zip here, there may be other benefits, but you're not gonna save costs. If we ship, shift it here, where we're at the peak of the rolling four hour average, move it to the zip, the rolling four hour average goes down and we can save money. Okay. There's a lot more to that. This is just a high level overview of that particular thing to keep in mind. Okay, so how can you get started taking advantage of zips? Well, one method is to look at converting some of your COBOL code to Java. Remember, COBOL's not zip eligible, Java is. Um, yes, 
there are other things I showed you the you know the taking advantage of uh, containers and uh, XML and uh, the DB2 stuff is, is fine too, but COBOL's worth considering because what's well, everywhere. Um, the current estimate is that there are between 200 to 250 billion lines of COBOL code in production. That was as of last year, 2021. And the additional estimate is that more is added every year up to 1.5 billion new lines of COBOL being developed every year. Another consideration is that the largest and most successful organizations rely on COBOL. You know, so up to 70% of the largest corporations use COBOL for mission critical work. And this includes your large banks, your travel companies and airlines, your point of sale systems, you know, government programs and agencies like social security and the IRS. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, for uh, reducing cost with COBOL because it's so uh, omnipresent. So at this point, I'm guessing that most of you would agree that there is some merit in converting at least some of your COBOL programs to Java. But you know how you go about doing that? And nobody really has time to sit down and recode their applications line by line. And there's billions of lines of code out there, as we just discussed. So, you know, without care and expertise, uh, the converted code isn't going to be efficient. It's not going to take advantage of all the features of that target programming language, you know, in this case, Java. You know, th there's even a derisive term uh, that's been created to describe COBOL code that wasn't effectively converted to Java, and that's uh, jo Jobal. Uh, this this is you know, stuff that you know, may be Java, but it looks and feels like COBOL still. The key really is to use conversion services that are built to understand how to convert from a procedural language like COBOL to an object-oriented language like Java. And, and this is where an automated tool really can come in handy. CloudFrame offers tools like this that produce quality Java code. The resulting Java can be run on the mainframe or redeployed to the cloud if you want. And the conversion is quick and seamless with no changes required to your existing data or processes. CloudFrame really offers two options for automatic conversion of your COBOL programs to Java. They offer code conversion tools, automation, DevOps integration, and deliver maintainable object-oriented Java that can integrate with modern technology that's available in your open architecture. You can use the tools to refactor COBOL source code to Java, again, without changing data, without changing schedulers, without changing other infrastructure components. It can be fully automated and integrate into your change management systems that you already use on the mainframe. So using these services, you convert COBOL to refactor Java, and your Java programmers can then work with that effectively. You know, in other words, it's not Jobal. The Java code will operate the same as your COBOL and produce the same output, but it will be refactored into object-oriented Java. The CloudFrame relocate offering is focused on converting your COBOL programs with the goal of running the code on the mainframe to take advantage of zips. And for organizations that want to keep maintaining COBOL code, but run Java on zips, you can use CloudFrame to refactor your COBOL to Java, but keep maintaining the code in COBOL. Using that approach, you can keep using your current COBOL programmers for maintenance, but run the code on zips because it's Java and get the benefit from that. Or completely convert to Java, use your developers, uh, your Java developers to maintain the code moving forward. So you've got you know, two options there. From a DB2 perspective, and you know, my heart lives in the DB2 world, you, first thing you start asking is what about access paths? 
you know, we all know that running a bind or a rebind causes DB2 to give us new SQL access paths. And, you know, if enough things change, then your access paths change, uh, and, and that can cause SQL performance degradation. Uh, but think about it. If the SQL doesn't change, then it's not really necessary to bind to create a new package. If we're simply converting COBOL code to Java code, the DB2 SQL statements don't get changed because the SQL doesn't change. You don't need a bind. The uh, CloudFrame helps you to use the existing uh, package with the new uh, Java code. Of course, there are nuances that you need to keep in, in mind as you track and manage this, but, but for the most part, you convert your COBOL code to Java code using SQL J with CloudFrame and you don't have to bind or rebind your SQL. Additionally, there's CloudFrame Renovate. That's the second offering. And that's focused on converting COBOL to Java with a goal of implementing in a cloud environment. So you've got, so let's stay with the mainframe. That's where I hope you'll go. Or renovate and move to the cloud. You can do some uh, stay on the mainframe, some move to the cloud, have your mix, you know, whatever you want, uh, working in a hybrid uh, cloud world moving forward. So with that, uh, we're at the end of the prepared material. This, this slide is going to show you a list of resources that you might want to keep handy for reference as you work with Zips at your, at your shop, the CloudFrame uh, website. Take a look at some of their offerings. Um, I wrote a bunch of Zip articles for uh, CloudFrame. You can uh, uh, look at this uh, uh, link that summarizes all of those and points to the uh, blog posts on CloudFrame. That list of software that exploits Zips is here. The list of DB2 for ZOS Zip usage is here. Okay, I just, just want to say thank you to CloudFrame for the opportunity to talk to everybody today. Thank everybody who joined the webinar. I'm glad that you uh, uh, joined us and uh, learned about Zips. And I just want to encourage you to really download that ebook. It goes into a little bit more detail uh, of some of the things that I talked about today. And it's uh, really a nice resource uh, for folks if who are looking to learn more about Zips and how uh, uh, using Java on Zips can help save you money. <laughs>